So it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Kevin Ellis to the workshop. Uh, Kevin is a tenure track assistant professor at uh, Cornell University, and uh, before that he was a PhD student at MIT. And he's done uh, very interesting work uh, uh, on uh, program synthesis, intersections with probabilistic learning. Uh, I've read many of the papers, and I found them quite exciting. So I'm very, very happy to, that you're here, and welcome, and go ahead. Thank you so much, Martin, for that intro. Um, so I'll be talking about how to make neural program synthesis more trustworthy. And I'll be presenting joint work with um, Wending Li, who is an advanced graduate student in uh, the CS department at Cornell, as well as Darren Key, who is an up-and-coming undergrad at Cornell. Um, so I'll start out by um, just schematizing the cartoon of program synthesis that I'll be working with um, through this talk. So when I talk about program synthesis, what I mean is I mean some kind of um, PL or AI system which takes as input a specification, which is some kind of human-authored thing which tells um, the synthesizer what kind of program it should construct. And then it's going to output some kind of source code. And um, the kind of art of program synthesis is defining exactly what this program is going to look like, like what kind of programs are we allowed to write, uh, what kind of specification is the user allowed to um, provide to the system, and what actually goes into the AI or PL system, which is going to do the synthesis from that specification. And different choices for those three different ingredients lead to a pretty broad space of different kinds of program synthesizers. So I'm just going to hit a few kind of points in that space to give you a sense of what this looks like concretely. So one thing you might imagine is that you might specify a program by writing down uh, maybe some kind of equation in logic or some kind of like rich type system which winnows down <clears throat> in a very precise way the uh, kind of program that uh, you're after. So one thing you might say if you wanted to um, synthesize this replicate code in this uh, kind of Haskell-esque functional language is you might say, well, I, I want a function which um, uh, takes something that's a natural number and something of type alpha and returns a list of alpha. But also, um, I want to say that the length of that list, so the length of the value um, new that's returned, has to be equal to n, where n is the natural number that I provided. So this is a particular kind of dependent type. It's a kind of a refinement of um, uh, uh, the more general sort of ML type. And the system which actually does this is this very cool system developed by Nadia Polakarpova called uh, Synquid. So another thing you might uh, think is, well, I um, don't want to write down stuff in logic. I want to just give examples of what the machine should do. So by far, the most famous system which does, which does this is called Flashville. So maybe I want to um, abbreviate names of universities. So I tell it that you know Cornell University goes to CU. I do the same thing for ETH. And then um, it would produce some kind of... Um, uh, code, um, like this Python code here, or maybe there's some kind of domain-specific language for like uh, uh, string processing macros. So um, there's another way that you might imagine specifying um, a program. So one way that you might imagine specifying a program is um, kind of the same way that you specify to your phone what text message you're going to send which is that you just start writing a text message and it's just kind of trying to figure out what you're trying to write. So I think of this as specifying with a partially completed program. And this is what the neural program synthesizers do that I'll be talking about um, over the next 45 minutes. So for instance, I might start writing some code that says, you know, uh, y equals slope times x plus, and if you can kind of figure out, this is probably some sort of linear equation, then you know maybe what you would um, infer comes next is something like the um, intercept of the linear equation. Or maybe you think it's like uh, b, because b is a common variable name for the constant. Or maybe you would look through the variables that are in scope and you would predict one of them. But let's just assume that like the right thing to synthesize is intercept. So this is one kind of spec, which is maybe a little bit, um, uh, has been maybe less popular in the kind of um, uh, purely symbolic heyday of program synthesis, but it's uh, one which um, I think is worth uh, focusing in on. And the reason why I think it's uh, worth focusing in on is because you can give very rich kinds of specifications by giving increasingly elaborate partial programs. So, for instance, I might um, 
start writing some code, which says I'm going to open some file and loop over some lines, and I might remember that I can do that using the open call in Python, but I might not remember that I can, uh, you know, uh, treat it like an iterator and iterate over the lines as though it were a for loop. So this is just a slightly more elaborate version of what was on the previous slide. So I, I've been calling this spec a partially written program, but in practice, the way that you often use these kinds of um, program synthesizers is you, you just give it some kind of comment that says what you want. So maybe you want to like flatten some lists. You don't remember how to do that in Python. You ask these autocomplete tools, which are effectively program synthesizers, to emit the code, and it produces this kind of nested list comprehension. So at this stage, I, I've been referring to this as a partially completed program. But the canonical way of using these synthesizers is to make that partial, partially written program mostly just be a comment or mostly just be some kind of doc string. So really, I'm going to think of this as you are specifying the program um, using uh, natural language. So this is an important departure from the program synthesizer I talked about earlier because my specification is no longer formal. I can no longer mechanically check whether this code here actually delivers a prom the promise that uh, is encoded by that natural language spec over there. And that kind of tension is what I'll be discussing. So I'm also going to focus on that tension. I'm not going to talk so much about what the program synthesizer here is actually doing. But just to very briefly give you a sense of what these things are, um, you know, there's a few different models that are kind of in this class. Uh, they're very large neural networks. They have them in the order of either um, on the low end, 1 billion parameters, on the high end, 100 billion parameters. Um, the most popular one is Codex. It's what underlies um, GitHub Copilot. Um, it's sort of a large neural net trained to do this auto-completion task on all of GitHub, plus all of Wikipedia, plus a bunch of other stuff. Um, and you, know, you can do some cool tricks, like you can write this comment here, which is trying to abbreviate some string. Um, I actually did plug this into Codex to see what it would do, and it, you know, it does the right thing. Um, and I think this is um, cool and interesting in several ways. So for one thing, um, people are, like a lot of people, are actually using uh, Copilot. In particular, I see my grad students using Copilot. As they're showing me their code, they'll actually pop up in, co they'll pop up in their IDE, they'll start writing their code, and I'll notice that this uh, neural network program synthesizer is suggesting to my students what code they should be writing. Um, but it's not just that it's helping my students save 5% of their time on coding. It's also that um, these systems, if you take them to extremes, can pull some really impressive tricks. So for example, the AlphaCode system can read a paragraph describing a competition programming problem like this. And I don't expect you to you know, read all of this in five seconds, but just to appreciate that it's multiple paragraphs, it's non-trivial, it's given to humans as an exercise in their programming abilities. And you can actually synthesize this code here, which reads, um, the like, reads a problem from standard input, does the computation using nested loops and weird like conditionals, and then uh, produces the answer. So you know, this system not magic, it's not actually as good as an expert human, it's kind of like a mediocre beginner human, but this seems like science fiction. It really does. Um, and so you might be thinking to yourself, well, you know, what, what's the issue with this? Um, uh, doesn't this just solve the problem of converting natural language into code? Isn't this just going to, you know, usher in some future of natural language prompted um, uh, software engineering? So here is the issue. Um, and I think it's uh, well summed up by this Facebook post by one of my buddies from grad school. So in particular, he was writing code with Codex. And it was saving him time. It actually worked well to synthesize solutions to the stuff he wanted. But he got hung up on a bug. And it burned multiple days of his time. And the bug he traced back to a very subtle error in code that the program synthesizer had produced. And this error would simply never have occurred in a system like Synquid or honestly in a system like Flashville. 
um, because he would have had to have written some kind of checks, some kind of test cases, some kind of uh, refinement types or something like that, which would have been automatically run by the synthesizer to guarantee that the code at least roughly did what he was expecting. So addressing problems like this, um, I think is important to making these systems practically use, uh, useful. And you know they're already being used, but they're also already causing some issues. So to take steps toward um, fixing this problem, um, we um, have a system um, which tries to verify the correctness of programs that are synthesized from natural language. Um, so if you want to uh, find the paper, uh, it's on archive now. Uh, this is the title and information of it. So um, before we start to think about how we could build a machine which verifies the correctness of programs that are synthesized from natural language, um, let's think about how you could, about how humans solve the same problem. Because as humans, we have a very similar challenge. So I want to communicate to someone what program they should write. So often I just talk to them and draw pictures and maybe get some examples. And somehow, using this kind of multimodal, mostly informal specification of what they should do, humans mostly get their code right. So um, you know, um, we'll look at how humans do it. But first, we'll look at sort of how traditional synthesizers do it. So if you go back to sort of the early days of program synthesis, um, people were thinking about like logical formulas, which said, um, you know, compute the maximum of a list, find some z that's in the list, and which it's and which is at least as big as every element in that list. So already they're thinking about situations where um, the program, if synthesis was successful, would be manifestly correct. Um, and you see this in modern synthesis too. Um, you'll try to synthesize loop invariants that um, entail the specification that is given by the user. Um, if you go to something which is maybe less precise, like synthesizing programs from examples, um, you know, at least you have the guarantee that for every program that you might synthesize, so for all P and P tilde, for every single input I, um, the uh, program um, on, the, on uh, that uh, input I will give the correct, correct output. So you at least have some guarantees when you're at least doing programming by examples or programs in the system examples. So now we have these neural network program synthesizers, which we can uh, prompt with natural language. Um, what is that going to look like? So in traditional synthesis, we say that our program entails a specification. In a neural network, what we would hope is that the programs in the neural net emits do something analogous with the specification. But if your specification is natural language, and this is obviously hopeless. Instead, what these systems do is instead of kind of enforcing this constraint that the program entails a spec, um, they define a distribution over possible programs that are conditioned on natural language. So this is actually what we're going to be able to work with. And somehow we need to get uh, maybe not some kind of formal guarantee that the program's correct, but some kind of um, uh, extra trust that it's correct. So here's kind of the um, conundrum then that we're confronting, which is that trust is kind of like verification, or at least some kind of uh, mechanical checking. Uh, we want to make sure our program entails some specification, but your specification is informal. It's like natural language. Um, and the reason why it has to be natural language is because we just don't have a big corpus of formal specifications on which we could train these neural nets. Um, also, it, you know, it can be hard to elicit rich formal specifications from kind of everyday coders. Um, and so in practice, what we do is we train these massive neural nets on uh, messy kind of in-the-wild code you'd see on GitHub. So in-the-wild code is lots of natural language comments that describe what kind of code comes next. So these neural nets have a kind of finely tuned sense of the association between natural language and the code which realizes the spec um, of that natural language. But they haven't been trained on a whole bunch of uh, dependent types. 
So you can't actually verify against this. And this is the kind of conundrum that we have to overcome. So uh, human beings face the same kind of conundrum. Um, and the way that they get around it is they um, write things like test cases. Um, so they say on certain inputs, my program should produce outputs which are, in this case, sort of almost equal, almost equal to something else. They also sometimes write code which um, uh, gives more interesting kinds of specifications, where instead of saying, on this input, you should make this output, they say, um, uh, for, this, for any inputs, the input and output should have some kind of relation between them. Um, so what's really going on here is there's some kind of human programmer, and they use their brain to produce not just a program, but also a formal spec. So you know, by specification, um, I really mean more broadly any kind of um, sound and mechanically checkable property of programs we expect to hold of the correct program. Um, so here we have some kind of, you know, um, sort of informal human process that generates both these um, formal artifacts, and there's some kind of mechanical checking process which goes on in between them. Um, but both of these stages, both the generation of the program and also the spec, could be unreliable because they're uh, produced by a human. So there's some other human who does code review. So this is the kind of ways in which humans escape the trust conundrum. And if we think about how a kind of future AI coding assistant could fit into this picture, um, you know, they could actually participate in either of these two stages, either the coding or the reviewing stage. But I'll be talking about how we could think about inserting a um, system into more of the coding stage. So in particular, uh, that means that we're going to be starting with some informal intention, so like some natural language. Then we're going to somehow formalize um, that intention into both a program and a spec um, using one of these large neural networks. Then we're going to enforce that the program actually entails a specification. And we're going to assume that there's a human in the loop. So some code reviewer is going to check both the program and the specification. And that means we're going to have to do a good job of constructing a specification that a human can understand, and which a human will find valuable for verifying the correctness of the program. So the spec plays this interesting role of both being good for the machine and also good for the human checker. And we're going to focus on both those things. So there's one last thing that I'm going to add, which was not part of the previous slide, which is that we want to know our own limitations. So in particular, in kind of classic program synthesis, um, the synthesizer might actually just say, I can't figure out any solution. Or it'll go into combinatorial la-la land and run for days, and you just figure that like, the combinatorial sort of problem is too hard. But with these neural networks, if you give them any problem, they'll give you an answer, no matter what. They can always produce code. Um, we would like neural networks, which actually can say, no, I don't know how to solve this problem. So that's the last thing here, is we want to just if we think we can't solve a problem, then just like don't try it in the first place. And if we do this, then what I hope is that we can avoid situations like this. Yes? Uh, point four of your slide, so you said that the human uh, checks both program and specification. You mean that they check that the program and the specification sort of match, or do you mean that the program and the specification matches the informal intention from point one? Uh, the latter. So the, anything mechanical is done by the machine. So um, we have a system which um, tries to meet these five goals. And we call it Speculizer, because it synthesizes both a, um, uh, it does program synthesis, but also synthesizes specifications. So we don't take specifications as given. We assume that they're uh, inferring them as part of the synthesis problem. So what it does is it takes some kind of natural language utterance. So like write a Python function that removes all the odd numbers from a list. And what Speculizer does is it produces from that informal language, some formal programs. I mean, of course, all programs are formal. I'm just saying formal to kind of contrast it with these. But it also produces um, formal specs. So we consider two flavors of formal specs. One is your kind of uh, usual input outputs. Um, and the other is some kind of logical relation, or what's sometimes called a functional specification, which just says that um, there's some predicate that holds between the input and the output of the list. So for instance, if we're sorting, 
then the length of the list should be preserved. And that's a uh, predicate that um, we can uh, write down, and it's kind of a general relation between inputs and outputs. Once Specializer has constructed candidate specs as well as candidate programs, it verifies them. So we construct this matrix of specs and programs. Uh, we just check each um, program um, against each spec. And we get this kind of grid of uh, kind of which programs uh, entail which specs. So from this grid, we need to somehow um, achieve the following goals. One is we need to be safe. We need to not produce um, buggy code. So if we think that we don't have any answers which are bug free, we should just say, sorry, I can't solve this problem. Also, we need to build trust. So we need to present to the user a certificate of correctness, saying here, I think the program is right, and here's why. So it has to pick a good spec which communicates why the program is correct. We also uh, want the system to overall just be more accurate. Like if it's generating more programs, it should do a better job of solving problems. So um, uh, we also just want to be able to solve more programming problems. So I'm going to step through how each stage of this pipeline operates. So the way that we generate programs, uh, yes? I had a quick random question. So is it possible to do like natural language processing, then you generate the code, and then you uh, in the reverse require the model to give a description of the program in natural language? And compare the two, and then you do iterative like this until the natural language uh, description of the code you generate closely matches the original. Uh, possibly. I mean, um, I think it would, uh, so, so first I think it'd be a cool thing to explore. Um, uh, we've not tried anything like that. Um, I think that could work very well and could give a high degree of assurance. It also hinges upon there being a good alignment between um, the description of the problem given in, in, in English and the actual source code which does it. Um, so if that alignment exists, then something which is more like semantic parsing, like mapping directly from the English to the code, uh, it could, can be very successful. Um, so here's how you actually generate programs um, with these kinds of neural nets. So we're using a system called Codex from OpenAI. Uh, it's maybe probably the flagship instance of these models. Um, so uh, we have some natural language prompt, like write a function to a subtract to list element wise. Um, we also have a name for the function. Uh, we have variable names for all the arguments. And we have a type signature. So we assume all of this is given to us. And when you ask Codex to write some code that does this, it'll produce something like this. So again, we're just asking it to do kind of auto-completion or complete a partially written program. The stuff in black is what was given to the neural net. The stuff in blue is what the neural net produced. So in order to get uh, formal specifications, um, we have to give it some kind of uh, other text to auto-complete in order to get it to write test cases. So we have some text telling us, you know, what's, um, uh, c what problem it should be solving. So how can we turn that into something it could auto-complete to cause it to generate test cases, assuming that we don't know what the program is? So we try some different ways of um, prompting this neural net to give us different kinds of specifications. And what we found worked was to just tell it pass to do implement and then ask it to do an assertion that checks whether it works. And then we'll autocomplete something like this. So here it just kind of made up a test case, which it thinks is probably an example of what sublist should be doing. So these are not the only specs that we care about. We also care about richer kinds of specifications. So Maybe, you know, we want to learn an assertion which says that um, the length of the output list should be something like the same as the length of the input list is a possible specification. So we can give it a different kind of um, thing to autocomplete, a so-called prompt, and it will produce something like this. Um, it'll say that I'm going to, you know, run the function that I just synthesized I'm going to make sure that the output length is preserved. I'm going to make sure that for each element, that element is the difference of um, the corresponding elements of the inputs. Now, um, how do we actually get it? How do we kind of coax the model into producing this output? 
Well, it it's probably should seem weird to you that the neural network just produced this output. And the reality is you, do have, you kind of um, uh, prompt or coax the neural network by giving it more examples of the kind of stuff you want. So the way that we coaxed it was we just made up other examples of, um, the, uh, of um, uh, logical relations between, imp between inputs and outputs of algorithms. So um, uh, we give it some examples like this. We give another example kind of like this of some other program. And then finally we give it the program we care about and it auto-completes um, some predicates that check relations between the inputs and outputs. Um, now, as you might imagine, these neural networks are pretty flaky. In fact, the kind of baseline assumption is that these neural nets are unreliable. So we're basically asking the neural net to um, uh, check its own work, but we also don't trust the neural net in the first place. Right? So what's actually going on is we're generating a bunch of different programs and specs. And what we hope is that kind of on average the specs are right. And so that means that if you satisfy more specs, then probably you are the right program. Also, um, we might assume other things, like that if lots of programs behave the same, then they all kind of suggest that the neural network is kind of voting for that solution. And so maybe that, that, you know, maybe that is the right program. So in general, you know, we have uh, an object like that, which is this array of um, uh, checking results. Um, and what we care about estimating is something like, for each program, how likely is it that it's correct? Um, and this is going to serve some of these downstream tasks. So the most basic task is just a kind of accuracy goal, like which program is the best one? Um, so um, one way that you might imagine predicting that is to say, well, a program is good if it satisfies lots of specs. Um, also, if lots of other programs satisfy the same specs, or in other words, are kind of observationally equivalent on the specs, then that suggests that the neural network is kind of um, uh, conspiring to select out those programs as being high probability. Um, however, if it turns out that the neural network is kind of um, producing a wide variety of programs that all do lots of different things, then that suggests that the neural net doesn't know, what it's, doesn't know how to solve the problem. So we also calculate um, kind of a histogram of different program behaviors, and we calculate the entropy of that histogram. And that turns out to be um, a good signal for predicting um, whether, the, whether the neural network is able to solve the problem in the first place. So what I just described here are actually just kind of um, uh, like features of this uh, matrix of checking results. And so in order to estimate this probability, what you can imagine doing is just plug these features into some uh, very basic machine learning model, which tries to estimate this probability here. So this is just a sort of standard ML pipeline where there's some kind of feature extraction and there's some kind of binary classifier, in particular logistic regressor, which is estimating this probability. So we assume we have some training corpus of programming problems. We can ask the neural net to emit both programs and specs. We assume we know which programs are correct. And then we can just train a model which directly regresses this probability. So now that we have that, now that we can predict this probability, let's go back to our objectives. Let's assume we can calculate that probability, or at least learn to approximate it. Um, now, which program is going to be best? Well, it's going to be the one which um, sort of argmax over all the samples um, our model thinks is most likely to be correct. So usually in this space, um, we don't talk about the probability of um, uh, the sort of top program being correct or the argmax being correct. We talk about what's called pass at k. We assume an interaction model where the user gets to provide k, or sorry, the, the machine provides k guesses as to what program is correct, um, and then the user um, picks which of those guesses they want. Um, and so this is really kind of more like accuracy. It's not really like trust, but it's something which is very popular to study in this community. And at minimum, we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't degrade accuracy. Our accuracy hopefully stays the same or at least gets a little bit better. So I'm going to report some pass at k numbers. 
to sort of convince you that it's at least not getting worse. And first, we should ask ourselves, what is kind of the best pass decay you could possibly get? So we're testing on these two data sets called human eval and MBPP. Um, uh, and uh, just briefly, uh, the salient difference between them is MBPP is a bit dirtier. Um, uh, human eval is a little cleaner. Um, and crucial for um, our purposes, human eval also often includes in the natural language description some example um, input outputs or some interactions with the function. So in the text of the spec, there are often um, within human eval um, some uh, input outputs already provided uh, to the system, assuming the neural network is clever enough to read the text and extract those input outputs. So how well could we do? So if we return to this picture, we're sampling a bunch of programs. If none of those programs are correct, we can't solve a problem, no matter how good the rest of Speculizer is. So Speculizer cannot solve any problem if all the samples from the neural net are wrong. So that means there's some kind of upper bound. It's around 95% on human eval. It's around 81% on MBPP. Um, we consider either the kind of one-shot interaction regime where you get one guess as to what program's right, and a uh, kind of larger k equal 10 budget of guesses. Um, and our system kind of like gets these numbers, um, which um, you know, basically means it's, if you look at a lot of guesses, then you're quite close to the oracle. If you're only looking at one guess, then there's an important gap between the oracle and our system. Uh, you can consider ablating parts of our system. So you might think, well, you know, um, we're generating both test cases and also um, uh, these logical relations, which of those is more important. And it turns out that, um, as you'll see in a moment, they're actually both important, but the inputs and outputs are more important than the logical relations. I think that the reason why that is true is not because logical relations aren't a good form of spec. I think they're actually a great form of, of specs, but just that on GitHub, there's a lot of example um, test case harnesses. A lot of examples of people writing a comment about what a function should do, and then writing some assertions that relate inputs and outputs to that function. So I think the neural network has just seen that happen a bunch of times, and so it's a little bit better at using the inputs and outputs compared to the logical relations. Now, um, the question of how do you rank a bunch of samples from these neural language models in order to pick the best program is something which um, uh, lots of people have looked at. Um, one heuristic that's that's been used in a number of recent systems is to kind of cluster samples by their execution behavior. Um, that actually does a lot worse than looking at these specifications. Um, uh, as we were developing this system, there was another system called Code T, which also generates test cases, although not logical relations, and there are other um, kind of differences between them. Um, so if you look at kind of a replication of Code T as well as the raw numbers, uh, you can kind of see that they're like in the ballpark. Um, on human eval, there does seem to be um, like a sort of a clear advantage for a specializer. On MPPP, there doesn't seem to be much of an, of an advantage in terms of the kind of raw accuracy. Um, and then you can compare with this other reason system, which um, uh, has an, an auxiliary neural network, which um, uh, ranks, uh, which learns to rank programs. And you can compare with kind of a random baseline, which randomly shuffles the samples. Uh, there's kind of a weird thing about the, these graphs, which is that Sometimes one system does worse than random. Sometimes one system beats the oracle. This is because there are hyperparameters in how you sample the neural network. And um, the higher order difference between um, our system, um, code T raw numbers, and in all uh, raw numbers are to some extent governed by those uh, sampling hyperparameters. So that's the reason why there's some funny things on that graph. Um, but the funniness vanishes when you sort of replicate it within our experimental setup. So <clears throat> the punchline of this is that you know it's sort of greater than or equal to these recent works in terms of raw accuracy, but the difference is not like enormous. Um, and what we actually care about is more like um, uh, trust or safety. So how could we make some moves toward those goals? So remember that these are our three objectives. Um, now how can we figure out how to make the system? Uh, kind of back off when it can't solve a problem. So if it, instead of proposing buggy code when it can't solve a problem, it should just say, I don't think I can solve this problem. So just like how down here, we said, I'm going to pick the program which I think is most likely to be correct. 
up here, what we can say is there's some threshold for probability of correctness. And once we exceed that threshold, we'll say, okay, I, I think I can solve that problem. And if we're under that threshold, then we'll back off and say we can't solve it. Um, now, whether this is successful is going to hinge on whether our binary classifier is well calibrated in a probabilistic sense. Yes? Just a quick question. These uh, numbers before, these are upper bounds, or these are exact numbers? Like, if, if a program is, if you're saying a program is uh, correct, uh, do you, is it supervised setting? You know that this is the program that... Like... Oh, good question. So we have uh, held out test cases. Okay. So both those data sets come with held out test cases, and we're evaluating on those as a proxy for correctness. But we do not have formal, right. like, we don't have something we can really verify against for these. Um, so... The way that we think about um, the problem of uh, safety, or just not predicting when you can't get any code that's not buggy, is that um, we kind of have two things. One is, can we solve a problem? And the other is, what is our predicted program for a particular problem? And there's really a trade-off between these. Um, in particular, um, if we try to solve more problems, we're going to be able to get more coverage. We're going to recall more solutions. But we might sacrifice precision. Uh, meaning that of the things that we predict, uh, some of them might be uh, buggy programs. So as we increase our threshold, we're going to sacrifice coverage for precision, and we're going to solve fewer problems, but also when we do try to solve something, we'll have uh, fewer bugs in our solutions. As we bring that threshold down, we'll get broad coverage but inaccurate precision, which means we can solve more problems, but we're also going to make more mistakes. And there's fundamentally a trade-off. So what does that trade-off look like? So the way we can do this is by sweeping different um, threshold values and then plotting these precision recall curves. So an oracle could get 100% precision recall. That's in blue. Random is not so great. And we're kind of in the middle. But what I want to bring your attention to is the fact that there's a quantitative difference between random and oracle in our system, which is that our system has this sloped line here, which presents a kind of trade-off between these two objectives. Um, and the fact that there exists that trade-off is because we're learning a probabilistic um, predictor. And because there, there's some degree of calibration uh, in, that, in those predictions, um, we can uh, kind of tune the system to achieve different trade-offs. So as a concrete example of that tuning, um, what this plot here is saying is that you, know, you, you could make it so that 23% of your programs have some kind of mistake in them. And you're going to, as a result, um, solve 81% of the problems that you could have solved. So that's sort of trying to get maximum coverage, but you're going to make a bunch of mistakes. Like, you know, I, I wouldn't trust a system which a quarter of the time had bugs in its outputs. Um, that would not be a very reliable program synthesizer. And over here, you know, the numbers aren't exactly the same, but qualitatively, the picture, you know, it's just kind, of, uh, kind of the same thing. What I think is more valuable to look at is the kind of high precision regime. So in particular, it's possible for human eval to use this learned model to um, solve one-third of the problems that you could have solved, which sounds bad, you know, you're losing two-thirds of the problems, but you make literally zero mistakes. Um, and you might think to yourself, well, maybe it's just memorizing the data in human eval. Um, but what we're actually doing is we're doing um, some cross-validation. So, it, like, when I say zero mistakes, I mean you train on the rest of the data, and then you can have a parameter setting which holds for the entire data set, not just that fold of cross-validation, which causes you to make no mistakes on the held-out data. The picture is less rosy for MBPP. Um, you can't tune it so that you get to this, um, uh, to broad, um, uh, to zero mistakes and some non-negligible recall. So I think that this is partially because MBPP is a lot dirtier, or a little bit dirtier than human eval, but I think the higher order thing is human eval actually has some test cases in the natural language. Um, so I think that's probably driving most of the effect. So no matter how you train your system, at the end of the day, um, you will never actually have 0% have, um, errors. Um, no data set is going to be as clean as human eval. So what that means is that we need to somehow put the human into the loop. We need to build trust by finding some specifications that certify correctness. Or if the program is buggy, we need some spec that tells the user that the system has messed up. 
So it's not just certifying correctness, it's also certifying incorrectness. Now, we synthesize specifications. Perhaps we could just uh, sample some specifications and show those to the user, communicate what the program does. So let's see whether randomly sampled specifications would be a good way of certifying uh, the correctness or incorrectness of a program. So to get some intuition for this, I'm going to show you two programming problems. One of those programming problems is going to be one where the neural network makes a mistake. For the other programming problem, the neural network gets it right. So here's the first problem. This is from human eval. So you have some list of numbers which correspond to the coefficients of a polynomial. You want to um, return the derivative of um, uh, the polynomial. So something like this. And what the neural network does is it returns something which marches through the list, it sort of drops um, one of those coefficients, and the other is it multiplies by the index of the list. Now, th th this seems probably like it's doing the right thing. It looks like it's dropping an element. You know, you want to drop the constant term. Um, you also want to multiply by some kind of index. Hopefully, there's no op by one errors here. It'd be very easy for there to be an op by one error. So, you know, it, it looks like it's kind of doing the right thing, but you would probably have to play with the code at least one or two times to make sure that it's correct. So let's look at a different um, example. So this example is a bit less standard. Um, it's asking you um, uh, to count the number of boring sentences in a string. So a sentence is boring if it starts with, with the letter I. So those are boring sentences. Okay. So let's think to ourselves, how would we count the number of boring sentences? Well, I guess we have to count the number of I's. But also, I guess we've got to do something weird with like um, uh, uh, punctuation that corresponds to boundaries of sentences, like periods and question marks and exclamation points. Those should be important in the, in the code. So let's see what the neural network does. Um, so it does something involving counting up the number of boredoms. It has a good variable name for this. Um, it does something involving punctuation. Uh, it splits the string into you know, tokens it can loop over, and it checks to see if things start with I and increments the number of boredoms. So that, that also seems like it's doing the right thing. Um, so do people think this code is buggy? Do people think this code is buggy? OK. So. Now, how are we going to communicate to the user what you just intuited? Well, let's suppose that we you know, think that some program is correct, or at least the neural network thinks it's correct. We want to communicate to the user some specification which the program entails. Well, we sampled a bunch of specifications. What if we just um, returned a random spec to the user and said that is, um, this is an example of what the program does. So here's an example uh, bore, uh, boredom test case, which says um, that on the input, I love this weather, you should return one. So this seems like a, uh, it's something that the program actually does satisfy. And also, um, indeed, there is one boredom in this string, because there's one sentence that starts with I. Now let's go to our, uh, our derivative routine. Um, so I showed, you, I showed you an input output last time. Now I'm going to show you a logical relation. So this is going to be some function which has some assertions in it that relate inputs and outputs. And it's going to be true of this program, and it's going to be used to certify the correctness of this code. And here is what it is. It says to do pass. So the random one was not so great. So how can we do better? So in some way, we want to kind of maximize our like communicative efficiency. So we want to say that uh, we want to pick a spec which is true of the program, and there's some probabilistic model, which says, um, given some spec, some programs are more or less likely. So how should we define this probabilistic model so it actually corresponds to some notion of informativeness or mutual information or communication? Well, um, there's a nice literature um, on things um, actually from linguistics it's called the Rational Speech Acts, um, and it's recently applied to program synthesis to try and find, like, um, uh, the best examples for a program. And it kind of has this general flavor of you define a joint distribution of our programs and specifications, 
And it turns out that um, if you make this distribution uniform, except you say that the program has to entail the spec, then um, uh, what this turns into is saying that we want the specification, which is true for the fewest number of other programs. So find me a spec, which is true of the program, which is minimizing the number of other programs that also entail that spec. So it's the most distinguishing or most selected program. So let's see what that does. So here was a random logical relation. And here is a kind of distinguishing or selective logical relation. It says that the length of the list shrinks by one. It says that um, each element of the output is the same as the subsequent element in the input multiplied by one plus the list index. And it gives you an example input in which to check that these predicates hold. And if we go back here to our buggy code, well, here it says in this sentence, which says, I have no idea what I'm doing, that should return two. Um, and remember the definition of a boredom, um, the letter I has to begin a sentence. And so that should actually have one boredom. Um, actually, the, the variety of sentences that the language model invents to um, exercise this algorithm is uh, really hilarious. It begins talking about its dog at some point. Uh, and it actually is just babbling uh, nonsense English. Um, so in conclusion, Speculizer is a synthesizer that creates specifications and it achieves some kind of precision or safety by backing off when it can't solve a problem. Uh, in addition, it tries to foster trust by constructing certificates not just of whether the program is correct, but also whether it's incorrect. So now in the next two minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why I think trust is important in the context of neural models for source code and what kinds of things in uh, the far future I think this could unlock. So as an example, um, if you have a GitHub repository, you probably sometimes get emails like this, which says that you have some kind of security vulnerability in your code base and it's high severity and you know um, someone could exploit your research code. Um, now, this is really a kind of program synthesizer because it's telling you how to modify your like dependency file. It's actually changing your software. And it's done in an automated way. And it's you know, released to many millions of people and it actually works well and it's reliable and you can trust it. It also is not really that useful. Um, I mean, it is useful, but like it's not, it's not, uh, it's, it's not you know, it, it's, you have to really use some imagination to call this a program synthesizer. In contrast, um, like what people, what humans can do when they're writing code is they can have a bunch of open issues on GitHub that they describe in natural language, and then they can issue some kind of pull request. Like maybe here, the issue was we're missing a two-string method, so now we just put in a two-string method. So this is a simple PR that like addresses this issue. So in principle, you could imagine some kind of science fiction synthesizer which looked at your GitHub issues and said, can I solve this one or can I not solve it? So it has to be safe. It can't propose buzzy, buggy code. And then it proposes some kind of um, simple implementation, not crazy wild amounts of code, just very simple things like you forgot a two-string method and I synthesize what it should look like. Um, but this is not going to be valuable if you begin spamming millions of people um, in their inbox with suggestions for buggy pull requests. So you need to be precise. You can't suggest buggy code. And also, you need some way of um, fostering trust with the person who you are suggesting this fix to. So again, this is science fiction. I don't think this is around the corner. I'm not saying that you know um, this is going to be something that we're doing like in the next year. But if we ever want to get something which is even epsilon toward this, I think we do need a substantial amount of more trust inside of neural program synthesis. So there's many challenges ahead. Um, in particular, they're not these neural models are not that good. I don't think that they're any way going to like replace human coders. Uh, even the Oracle on these basic Permian problems was only at like 80 or 90%. Um, we still right now have to execute programs. Um, uh, we have to verify them. That can be hard. Um, but you know, there's also opportunities. Like there's lots of languages for specifications um, which have different trade-offs. Um, so in, you can imagine using richer logics for um, these kind of verification uh, representations. So um, that's it, and thank you for your attention.
Okay, questions? Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Martin. Thank you for, for a very nice talk. Uh, may I ask you something very, very basic here? So if I understood correctly, the workflow here is to prompt the codex for emitting the program, and then emitting specification in the form of a number of test cases, and do a number of clever things for post-processing uh, the results to see how trustworthy the specification and how good is the program. That's correct understanding, right? Yes. Okay, so my question, uh, someone who, like, works slightly, like maybe it's a little bit closer to foundations of semantics and whatnot. Is it really uh, where the field currently is and where it's going to take these large established models and figure out how to use them as black boxes, as a crystal ball? Or uh, there is some work that you can mention that actually looks into how to create those models that, let's say, take semantics or specification inference into the account in the first place? Um, yes. So people do work on um, uh, both scaling these models to larger and larger data sets and to larger and larger model sizes. Um, so you know, uh, Google and OpenAI are, are quite active in doing that. Um, also, uh, sort of outside the massive GPU centers that they have access to, there are people who um, ask themselves, like, how can I um, put into the model some knowledge of the structure of a programming language? Um, and that can make it better at um, uh, uh, programming. Um, one very bizarre thing that seems to happen is that um, pre-training these models, these neural networks, on uh, natural language text like Wikipedia seems to make them better at programming. So the way these models are often trained, in fact the way that uh, Google's version of Codex was first trained is they trained it on the whole web, mostly just natural language, and then they fine-tuned it on a small amount of programs. Um, so if you Inject into the model a bunch of constraints about like semantics of the language. You you lose that um, uh, pre-training. Um, these are all empirical questions. I don't know what the right um, uh, trade-off is in order to eke out the most performance of them. Um, but I'm excited to see like what happens in the next few years because I think what you're saying like uh, that might actually be sort of the de facto thing people do, or it also just might not be. I'm not sure, um, but it'll be exciting. More questions? Okay. So when you're making the matrix of, say, programs and test cases that were generated, so and you try to make this argument about probability, like high probability of the problem, don't you need somehow any at least intuition for why the test cases that you generate would be independent? So all this depend, all this, all this calculation relies on independence of these uh, samples. Yeah, yeah, um, and they're not independent. Like two of the test cases in principle could be almost exactly the same or even exactly the same. We deduplicate them actually, but um, in principle you might not do that or you might want to say that two of them are similar so you sort of don't double count them. Um, you can write down uh, more sophisticated graphical models which take into account those kinds of correlations um, in my experience, just whiteboarding it, uh, inference becomes intractable in those graphical models because the number of random variables is kind of the number of programs times the number of specifications, and there's sort of a bunch of edges between them. Um, but I think in principle, like, there probably is some way of exploiting the fact that there's correlations between them. And, um, uh, like, you know, the, the actual methods we're using are super simple. It's just like, counting up some statistics and training linear models. I'm sure that this is not um, uh, the most you can eke out of the samples from the language model. So you said, um, if I understood correctly, uh, the specifications can be in the form of input-output pairs, right? Yes, or logical relations. Uh -huh. Also, trust is uh, computed over the whether like the generated program is matching the generated specification. Yes. So I was uh, so could, you could simply what I was thinking is that you could simply uh, generate the program and then give it some random inputs and then give some random outputs. So simply this program satisfies these two input output pairs, right? So then uh, if you use those input-output pairs as, as the specifications, then the trust would be very, like, 100%. Yeah, I, I think that would be another good source of specification. 
Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so when you are testing the amount of trust that you inspire, are you just reducing what happens with the specification over the program into some number, or did you put this in front of people to see if it actually inspires human trust? Uh, we would love to put it in front of humans to see if it inspires human trust. Um, we have not done that. Um, in the appendix to the archive post, we have a long list of programs and specs we make. Um, uh, so apart from me and my co-authors, uh, no one else, as far as I know, has actually like picked through it. But it'd be great to do like, a, a human study, um, at least anecdotally, when I look at the random specifications, they look usually kind of bad, and usually the selective ones look better. But I don't have any numbers which say how much better they are. And that'd be really cool to collect, and if we get to refine those kinds of techniques. Okay, I just I just have one last question. Uh, so on the on the test cases that you generate, let's suppose you have to like, can you apply this program synthesis interaction models, where you have two programs and you're trying to find the differentiating output for the same input, to ask the user what you want and then somehow prune the space. Um, you could, um, uh, like there. Um, there is a lot of interest um, in not just ranking language model outputs, but sort of combining them with synthesis um, uh, interaction models. Um, we haven't done that in any like deep right. way, but um, I think ideas like that would be cool to explore. Okay, so uh, yeah, thank you very much for the great talk and. Uh,